Okay, and welcome to another edition of The Edge in the A-Level Economics. This is where we take a topic on the syllabus, key topic. This time it's international economics, and we ask 10 multiple choice questions. Those of you who are in the live revision webinar can post your answer in the chat window. Those people who are following on YouTube, every time we do a question, press that pause button at the appropriate moment. Take a moment or two to think about the answer and then come back to us. We can share the answer together and the explanation. So here we go. I think quite a nice selection of 10 questions covering international economics. Uh, uh, let's see what you can do. Good luck with these questions. Here we go. Question number one, the diagram. On the right-hand side here shows quarterly changes in Japan's GDP from 2010 through to 2015. Quarterly changes. Over the period shown, how many recessions has Japan experienced? Press the pause button, have a go at the answer, and then come back to me when you're ready. So the data shows the quarterly percentage growth in GDP for Japan. Quite volatile, as you can see, from quarter to quarter. But how many recessions has Japan experienced? What did you put? The correct answer to question one is B. There have been three recessions in Japan. Recession conventionally is defined as two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. So we have to eliminate those little periods where there was a one quarter change in GDP um, followed by an upturn. So there were three recessions as shown in my diagram. I hope you got that one right. Let's move on to question number two. A country with demand pull inflation decides to fix its exchange rates against other currencies above the purchasing power parities. What is likely to happen to the macroeconomic indicators shown in the table below? What's likely to happen to the interest rate, the policy interest rate? What's likely to happen to inflation? What's likely to happen to the current account balance? Have a go, pause the video, and come back to me when you're ready. What did you get for question two? Well, the country has demand pull inflation, so it's looking to exert some deflationary pressure on the economy. To do that, it's decided to fix the currency at quite a high level, certainly above purchasing power parity. So what's likely to happen is that the interest rate will have to be higher to maintain a strong exchange rate. The inflation rate will therefore come down because of the impact of the stronger exchange rate and the higher interest rates on monetary policy. It's a deflationary monetary policy. So you're looking for an increase in interest rates, a decrease in inflation, so it must be, therefore, C. And we'd expect the current account to worsen. A strong exchange rate, for example, may make this country's exports less competitive, and it also makes imports cheaper coming into the country. So I hope you got that one right. Not an easy question. The answer is C. Let's move on to our third question. If a country is committed to its fixed exchange rate, yet allows free capital flows, which of the following is it unlikely to be able to have much flexibility over? Is it direct and indirect taxation? Is it monetary policy interest rates? Is it the size of the national debt? Or is it the scale of labour migration? Press the pause button, please. Have a think about your answer and come back to me when you're ready. OK, so the right answer to question three is B, interest rates. It's one of those quirky little things in macroeconomics where a country can have two of the following three. If it wants, for example, exchange rate stability and it wants free capital mobility, it doesn't have much freedom over interest rates. It needs to use interest rates to influence the exchange rate in a managed exchange rate system, for example, or a semi-fixed system. The UK has chosen to have a floating exchange rate, therefore it's sacrificed exchange rate stability, but that means it has freedom to set interest rates for domestic objectives, and it also allows it to keep capital mobility. The takeaway point is that a country can have two of these, two of these, these three things but not, not all three at the same time. Now, that's a tricky question. Uh, if, you, if you've got three out of three, you're in a very good place. Here's question four. A fall in the value of a country's currency would, Keteris paribus, other things remaining the same, cause the price of imported 
raw materials to go up in domestic currency terms. Imports more expensive. Which of the following, one, two, three or four, would reduce the short term impact on domestic firms in terms of the inflationary cost of raw materials? Which of the following would reduce the short term impact? I'll give you a clue for this one. Uh, one is right. So press the pause button, have a go, see what you get. Thanks for coming back. Here's the answer to question four. What did you put? Well, we know that one is right. It doesn't really help, does it? The right answer is A. One and two only are correct. Uh, two is right. If you've got good levels of stocks, for example, timber or whatever it is, copper, zinc, if you've got good stock levels, then you can use those stocks even if the price of imports has gone up. You might be able to... Maybe, maybe you've bought those stocks beforehand at a cheaper price. So stocks act as a shock absorber in that sense. However, three is wrong. If you've got a high import to GDP ratio, that means that you are heavily dependent on imports of these products. So, for example, a construction firm might be heavily dependent on specific imports of a particular type of brick or, or, or timber. And therefore, you know, the ratio of imports to their output will be quite high. They'll have to pay the higher price. And four is wrong uh, because if the domestic producers don't have a comparative advantage, they won't be able to produce the materials, the raw materials, more cheaply than overseas. So the answer to question four is A. OK, let's move on to question five. A Chinese-owned company builds a factory in the UK with a view to exporting 100% of the final product to the EU. What is likely to be the longer an impact on the UK's balance of trading goods and on its current account balance? Press the pause button, have a go, come back to me when you're ready. OK, what do we think on this one? I think the right answer to this one is C. The reason being that the current account, sorry, the balance of trading goods should improve. China is building factory in the UK, exporting to Germany, to Holland, to France, to Belgium. So those products were counted as UK exports. That would improve the trade balance. The current account balance in theory should improve, but actually if corp keep in mind, of course, that the profits from the Chinese investment may well leave the UK and be re remitted back to China, which would worsen the current account balance. So on balance, I think the current account balance change would be uncertain. So much depends on how many exports are sold, and what happens to the remitted profits. I think the answer is C. If you want, by the way, any revision resources on the balance of payments, then just uh, press your camera towards the QR code, and that will take you to the special section on the Tutu website. So we're halfway through. How are we doing? Let's move on to question six. A country is a member of the EU, but it decides to leave. Hmm, topical. In doing so, it no longer pays towards the EU budget. However, it also now has a common external tariff imposed on it by virtue of being outside the single market. In the absence of any other changes, the impact of these changes on the country's balance of payments would be what? What's going to happen to the secondary income balance transfers? What's going to happen to the trade balance? A fall means a deterioration, a rise signifies an improvement. Press the pause button, have a go. OK, so what do we think for question six? My instinct is that the answer is B. The secondary income balance will improve because the UK is a net contributor to the European Union. We'll no longer have to pay somewhere between eight and twelve billion pounds a year net contribution to funding the European Union budget. So that will improve. The trade balance, however, will fall, will deteriorate. In the absence of any offsetting factors, the European Union would then impose a tariff on the UK once we leave the customs union. In theory, unless we negotiate a trade deal with the EU, we will be subject to European Union trade tariffs, which will make our exports more expensive in the EU single market. Again, if you want to have any uh, special notes, study notes and things and presentations on Brexit, the European Union and the UK, just point your camera at the QR code and that will take you direct to the special section of the Tutor Due website. Let's move on to question seven. 
which of the following represents a possible data set for a country's balance of payments, assuming that there are no errors and omissions. Have a go. OK, this is a balance of payments account. What do we know about the balance of payments? The balance of payments has to balance. So therefore, we're looking for A, B, C or D. We're looking for where the account balances, the pluses and the minuses balance up. And the right answer is C, foreign account surplus, capital account surplus and financial account deficit sums to zero. The balance of payments has to balance. It must sum to zero. OK, here's question eight. Ah, this is about the terms of trade. A country is most likely to experience an improvement in its terms of trade when what? A, the current account of the balance of payments worsens. B, monetary policy base interest rates are lowered. C, foreign currency reserves are depleted. D, the currency appreciates against other currencies. Press the pause button and come back to me when we want to go through the answer. OK, so the answer to question eight, an improvement in the terms of trade most likely when the currency appreciates against other currencies. Terms of trade index is measured by the index of export prices on the numerator divided by the index of import prices. And when the pound or the currency appreciates, exports become more expensive, imports become cheaper, Therefore, the numerator has gone up, the denominator has gone down. The terms of trade index will rise. Again, if you want special revision notes on the terms of trade, just point your camera at the QR code on the screen. Here's question nine. Under which of the following circumstances will a depreciation of a country's currency result in a, an improvement of the trade balance on the current account. What do we think? The answer is A. Why is it A? Because it's the Marshall Learner condition. The Marshall Learner condition. It says that the balance of payments will improve current account if the sum of the elasticity of demand for imports and exports is greater than 1. In this case, the coefficients 0.9 and 0.8 add up to 1.7, and that will make uh, an improvement to the balance of payments. There's no other column where that's the case. B, there'll be no change in the balance of payments. Uh, C, the balance of payments will improve on the current account, or would worsen on the current account. And likewise with D, price elasticity of supply of exports does not form part of that equation. Therefore, it's superfluous to the answer. The answer is A, to do with the Marshall Learner condition. And here's the final question in our blast tonight. Suppose that the sterling exchange rate against the dollar, the US dollar, changes from one pound buys US dollar 150 to one pound buys US dollar 120. In other words, a depreciation of sterling. The immediate impact on the UK in terms of trade and the balance of trade will be what? Have a go. OK, what about this one? Key word here is immediate impact. We think the answer is A. Both will worsen. In terms of trade will worsen. If you go back to the original definition from the previous question, the terms of trade is the index of export prices divided by the index of import prices. After a depreciation of the exchange rate, export prices will go down, the numerator falls, import prices go up, the denominator in the equation goes up, Therefore, the terms of trade must worsen. The balance of trade, well, we think it worsens initially in the immediate effect through something called the J curve effect, which is the imports become more expensive and we carry on buying them in the short term and therefore spend more on imports. But it takes a while for exports to pick up as they become cheaper in overseas markets. There's a time lag effect. The J curve idea suggests that the balance of trade may initially worsen as a result of a depreciation of the currency. And the question does say the immediate impact. So that's why we think the answer to this question is A. Okay, well, I hope you think that was a nice, neat, interesting selection of 10 questions on trade theory and economics and exchange rates. 
If you've got seven or more out of ten, that's a pretty good answer. Anybody who got eight or more is doing fairly well. But again, have another go and point that camera at the QR codes if you want some special tutor two resources. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining in. See you soon.